perfect. Hello to everyone. Hello to everyone. Uh, my name is Alex Athanasoulas. I'm the president and CEO of Styrix's Group, the globally uh, awarded design consultancy firm and founder of Metallaxis, a think tank and platform enabling forward-thinking people to connect and shape the future in a positive way. I'm deeply honored to chair this uh, panel today, and I would like to thank, before we start, Dr. Frank Jürgen Richter, the founder and chairman of Oracis, for his work in bringing us all together in such a an impactful way. Um, the panel we have uh, today is titled Closing the Digital Divide. Um, elderly and infirm people in the US, as well as people in less developed countries, still have difficulty in gaining digital access. How can we help them? How can we help them access cash, arrange a medical visit? How to support the left behind non user? Uh, I think we will cover a bit of more than the um, difficulty in the digital divide in the elderly people. Uh, and how can we actually scale trust and promote digital inclusion? Um, with us today, we have uh, four very important uh, panelists. I'm, I'm very honored, as I said again. Uh, please let me allow to um, start with uh, uh, Daniela, Daniela uh, Herman is a serial entrepreneur, the founder of uh, Topan Ecosystem, with a mission to grow and scale businesses while developing economic, ecological, and ethical triple E values, contributing to the uh, global positive change. Daniela is the president and founder of Topan AG and Topan Mapufin AG, and sits on the advisory boards of young growth companies in agritech, fintech, and retail. She has an MBA from the University of Zurich, and a Bachelor in Economics from the University of St. Gallen. She was also the finalist at the Enterprising Women of the Year Awards in 2014, a nominee for the Women in Tech uh, 2020, and is a member of E100, a global action community for deeper impact. Welcome, Daniela. Thank you today for being with us. Uh, Florence Mosan uh, is with us from New York. Florence is a partner at HT Capital Advisors in New York. Uh, and she's the founder and CEO of Never Tech Late, uh, which aims to promote lifelong learning and to reduce feelings of social isolation. Never Tech Late empowers retirement community residents through a state-of-the-art instructional design in technology education to engage in lifelong learning and combat isolation. She holds two MBAs from Indiana University of Pennsylvania and ICN and was a 2017 fellow at Advanced Le uh, Leadership Initiative at Harvard University. Uh, welcome, welcome, Florence. It's a, it's a pleasure to have you with us today. Thank you. Uh, Girish Nadkarni, uh, Girish, welcome again. Girish Nadkarni was until November the Chief Executive Officer of Total Energy uh, Ventures, the 500 million corporate venture fund of Total Energy uh, based in Paris. Prior to that, he was the founder and president of ABB Technology Ventures, the corporate venture arm of ABB. Girish earned his undergraduate and law degrees for the university, from the University of Bombay, uh, his Master of Law degree from the University of Virginia, and an MBA from Harvard, where he was designated a Baker Scholar. Girish has been listed on the Global Corporate Venturing Power List 100, and for the past seven years is in the top 20. Uh, again, welcome, Girish. It's an honor to have you with us. Uh, Jorge Lopez, uh, Jorge, welcome. Uh, he's joining us from Mexico, by the way. We have a quite diverse geographical uh, panel today. Jorge is the president and CEO of Milas para, la, para el Retiro, as well as a founding partner and director of Vitalis Pension Experts. And he also holds numerous, numerous positions on various boards of directors and investments. He has a degree in actuary from the Instituto Tecnologico Autonomo de Mexico, ITAM, a master's degree in history of thought philosophy, uh, and two diplomas in intelligence, uh, again from ITAM, uh, uh, in um, intelligence and applied statistics. Welcome again, Jorge. I'm sorry my Spanish is not that good. So thank you very much all for joining us. Uh, we are uh, missing Victor, who for some reason uh, he hasn't joined us. I hope that uh, he will so in the course of uh, the panel. Uh, let me start by asking a, a general question to get the ball rolling. 
Um, digital divide, as we said, is a bit different from the viewpoint uh, of each one of you. Uh, can we? Uh, can you take uh, a few minutes to explain how you experience and how you actually uh, define uh, the borders and the boundaries of digital divide? Uh, Florence, if you allow me, can we start from you? Sure. So um, I think it's very judicious, uh, Alex, to, to try to define what we are going to uh, be speaking about for this uh, during this panel. So in, in my case, the digital divide has a, has a limit in terms of um, uh, which part of the population I understand its affects most. Uh, nowadays, and uh, in my case, it's it's older adults uh, who are a growing part of our population um, it, all over the world. But if I uh, restrain my uh, data to uh, the United States between 2008 and 2018, the population 65 and plus, which is whether we like it or not defined as older people, um, has actually increased you know, 35% and is expected to keep on increasing to a, a total of 71 million in the U.S. by the end of this uh, decade, which means about 20% of our population here in this country. And again, the, the numbers are very similar in many countries all over the world will be 65 and plus. And at the same time, we will see digital devices and uh, services increasing in, in an almost parallel um, curve. But the, the curve in this case don't meet very often and there's about 50% of uh, older adults who don't have digital uh, access, whether because they don't have the hard broadband access or they don't have the means or the education um, to access uh, the digital services and knowledge. And for me, that's the digital divide to answer your question. And of course, the pandemic has increased and uh, emphasized that digital divide because it's not only an issue of communication and isolation, uh, which is a big source of illnesses and diseases for anybody, but especially for other adults. But it's now accessing uh, core services, like um, how to get, for example, a COVID or vaccine appointments during uh, the pandemic if you had not the digital savvy uh, how to uh, access uh, the internet. I hope I didn't take too much time. It's a long definition. Wouldn't fit in a dictionary. It is for us. Yes, yes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your uh, answer. Um, I'd like to ask uh, Daniela uh, if she can also uh, tell us how she feels about the digital divide in a in a in a nutshell. Thank you, Daniela. Yes, so I mean, I agree fully with Florence with regards to the straightforward uh, phenomena that you can almost not, you're almost handicapped if you cannot use your device anymore, right? Because you cannot even, you know, you, 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 you cannot like certain, I mean, just imagine the bank accounts. If you can't use your, your uh, QR code, then you can't enter the bank account kind of anymore. And, 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 and so, these things are uh, becoming more and more complex. That is totally true. And on the other hand, um, uh, we are dependent on the internet. Is the internet the reliable medium? That's one question, right? Um, so everybody is teaching each other on the digital divide on this internet that uh, I'm, I'm asking myself. We have currently tra trends nationally that internets are being built, again, within nations. So independent internets. What does that cause? Secondly, we have the trend of the metaverse, which is unifying everything under one hood. But who is the hood? And what's with the passports? And do we maneuver in the metaverse then with a global passport and on the ground with a Swiss, German, whatever, African, whatever passport? Indian passport doesn't really matter. So where is... Um, that what we actually see as a handicap is a handicap or maybe just like a disadvantage. Um, where is that anyways leading us, right? And that's kind of a more philosophical question, right? Do we straightforward go into it to the question we have from this workshop? Yes, digital divide is an issue. Sure. Yes, people have to amend, adapt to it and learn and have a facilitation that is easy. But if you look at it from a critical point of view, what are we actually forcing people into? 
What are we making people dependent of? What is the internet? What are the national trends on the internet regarding security? And are we going into a global or are we going into a nationalistic trend, right? And as said, if we take the metaverse, are we just trying to go under the hood of US or under the hood of the Chinese or under who's using the metaverse to kind of define their world power as a next player? And I am totally not for these centralistic games and certainly not for war games. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think you, you've opened such a broad uh, uh, definition and a broad discussion about uh, digital divide, uh, uh, which is very interesting and very difficult to follow within the time we have. Um, Victor, welcome. Uh, Hello. Hey. Thank you for, for being with us. Uh, Victor Luxer, I, I'm, I'm not sure how to best pronounce your last name. Victor, no, is no, no, I don't mind. <laughs> But, uh, but it has to be the right way. So, uh, so it's Guiche in Catalan. Guiche, perfect. Uh, so Victor Guiche is a serial entrepreneur with seven years experience working with global technology companies. He is currently advising Series A plus companies addressing sizable markets led by season management. Uh, he's the managing partner of Guiche and Partners and until recently the co-CEO of BitSeat in London. Victor has a degree in international business trade and law tax from ECERP Business School in Madrid. Welcome, Victor, again, and thank you for I, joining. I studied in uh, in SER, but I am a business school dropout, so okay. never technically finished, but <laughs> for good. Perfect. Like you. <laughs> thank you. So we we are having a first round of defining uh, each one how we see the digital divide. Um, uh, Florence and uh, Daniela were first. Uh, can I please go to Girish? Girish, hi. Hello. So we all know the concept of digital divide, and we typically define it in terms of people who are unable to access the internet, so to speak. Uh, either it's because of lack of income, lack of connectivity, uh, being in a different part of the world. So you can divide it by income, by geography, by age. I think. Uh, uh, Florence has mentioned that, and as some of you may know, there was a big movement in, 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 in Spain recently where an old gen older gentleman called, uh, uh, you know, uh, created sort of a, a, a movement which he said, you know, soy mayor, no idiota, saying I, I am old, not an idiot. And so the banking industry had to adapt to the fact that the older people could have more personal uh, touch. Uh, and then Daniela touched on the, co on the concept of balkanization or splintering of the Internet where people are living in their own bubbles. So people who are living in, in Russia don't have access to a certain amount of information. People living in China don't have access to a certain amount of information. I mean, it's, it's amazing when you meet Chinese students that they have never heard of Tiananmen Square. Never. I mean, the concept doesn't even exist for them. So you can divide and explain the digital divide many, many different ways. And I think as a number of you have pointed out, the ability to survive and thrive in today's world is critical. It's important that we, we are able to access it, whatever the reason may be, whether it's age, income, geography, lack of connectivity, etc. Uh, let me just throw in two quick examples of something people don't normally think of when they think of digital divide. We normally think of digital divide as the ability to get onto Facebook or internet banking or whatever. So as part of my venture group, we also have something called energy access team where we invest in companies where we create uh, access to energy for people who are living off grid, people in Africa, people in Southeast Asia, etc., where there is no electricity. So you do things like rooftop solar, and these are pay as you go systems. So you use a certain amount of electricity and you pay for it and you keep. But the problem is for that to function, you have to have internet access such that you can actually measure how much electricity is based. You need to have payment systems through the internet, etc. So even if you're living off grid, you still cannot escape the impact of lack of access to the internet or whatever communication. The other thing is one of my prior lives, I used to run robotics for ABB. And what's very interesting is if you look at the access of robots for thousand employees, you know, clearly Japan is at the top and Switzerland and France and others are very high. 
But surprisingly, the U.S. is quite low. And you'd think a, a, a more advanced country like U.S., the robotics would be very high. And the reason very simply was the average U.S. blue-collar worker is very comfortable with anything mechanical. You give him a screwdriver and a spanner and a hammer and he's happy. But if you put a screen in front of him where he has to program the robot, he suddenly freezes because he has no access, he has no experience, he has no etc. And so he is now being left behind of the whole industrial revolution, and you know, which, of course, we can discuss about all the political and social implications of the income inequality, etc. So I just wanted to lay that on the, on the table. Thank you. Thank you very much, Girish. Jorge, good afternoon. Hi, thank you. Uh, in my case, good, good, I've been... Sorry, good morning, you're in Mexico. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Good, <laughs> yeah good, uh, good morning, sunny and shining on this place, on the earth. Um, I am a monothematic entrepreneur working only for the elder in social security and pensions. Um, of course, I read a lot about a wider range of things, but what I'm going to tell you about is what Mexico has been doing in order to close the gap on, on this digital for the end. And the way that I see it and my company, what it is doing is trying to reduce that gap before you are a disadvantage or an, an ill person. Being disconnected uh, from the digital world, it exaggerates, exaggerates uh, the condition that you have. So if you begin working with let's say 40, 50 years old persons from poor communities in order to save for their retirement through the digital breach, working with what our government has been doing. Now, I am sure that those guys, when they're 60 or 70 years old, they will be able to be at least connected with what, what they need to attend. There are a couple of companies helping us in this. In this. this is Amazon. Amazon is on board with us, helping uh, the saving as you spend concept in our country, as large uh, as well as the largest cinema chain around the world, which is uh, Cinepolis. These two guys are helping me with the technology, giving up money to all the savers that we have in Millas para el Retiro in order that they can spend it when they're older. And what has happened, and this is the interesting part, a lot of pensioners, already 65 to 70 years old, are knocking the door of Millas para Retiro, asking us, can I still be part of this movement? And the Mexican system of the saving system, the, the national social security, allows them to use that account as a debit account. So today my age group is going up and up and up because these guys, just with the incentive that Amazon or Cinepolis are giving up money every time you save at least 2.5 US dollars, they are working their way up using our application for their daily expenses. So um, that is the way that we have learned through behavioral economics and studying a lot of social security around the world and building on top of what the large government investment and the pension industry did in Mexico and just giving it a little bit twist of, from the fintech perspective of an entrepreneur. Thank you. Thank you, Jorge. Victor, uh, thank you again for joining us. Uh, what is your view of the digital divide? How do you experience, how, how do you define it in your line of work, which is uh, mostly crypto, am I correct? Yeah. So for me, the digital divide is uh, the art or the space of addressing the, uh, the, the gap of skills between uh, different generations that were uh, wired in uh, different uh, uh, social conditions in terms, not, not uh, on the economic ones, but in terms of, uh, of, time, ta uh, of uh, century, timeline, I mean, many things that makes... Uh, makes uh, most makes uh, generations that are beyond 45 50 60 to to have a a little bit more of a, of effort to pending to do on on certain tasks in the digital space while uh, others like me I'm 20 28 so I was born at six years old with a computer so the 
earliest game I played was FIFA 98, right? So that for me, for me, a computer was the f something I I grown with, and and that's for me the the definition of of digital divide is is something that can be uh, sorted out, as I think mobile phones prove, where uh, general skills can be uh, acquired by by most of the population. And what's going to be interesting is during the next uh, the next years is how we how we give to the public the ability of interacting with computers with no coding with uh, and and being able to to execute uh, things on their day to day without uh, necessarily having to learn skills that sometimes might be difficult to learn for people who is not uh, very versed in mathematics or uh, language or etc cetera, etc cetera, no so that you have to be a little bit native to be a, a programmer Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I think the last point is very interesting for the whole discussion. If I'm allowed, we, we touched very many different parts of the digital divide uh, in, in terms of age, in terms of technology, in terms of geography, in terms of uh, uh, politics, uh, in terms of um, how the world is changing. If I can add something um, we need to take in account the fact that the world is changing faster and faster and faster every day. So there is no way that we can actually uh, totally overcome or fight this digital divide. Uh, and there is no way that we can, uh, I think, um, uh, be inclusive 100% of everyone because there is new technology, there are new platforms, there are new ways of um, connecting people. Um, uh, I guess the last point of uh, Victor is valid because eventually the interface between us and uh, whatever uh, is the technology out there or the different ecosystems and the different platforms we use will be much more friendly and will allow more people to um, access that without the, the need of special skills, without the need of special skills and knowledge. Yeah, certainly, the technology success is not making technology, but success is making accessible to anyone. Correct, correct. So, if we can uh, start the, the second round of uh, the discussion, and we'll go back to you, Florence. Uh, after this initial discussion, uh, what 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 is your vision of um, closing this gap, uh, and how do you really believe we can all work? I think from all the points we, we heard, because they are all very valid, uh -huh. in order to uh, help uh, elderly people as uh, uh, the ones that uh, you're actually focusing in, um, in closing this digital divide. Uh -huh. Actually, Victor gave me the, the, the perfect translation when he, uh, he last said, and I was taking notes, I'm paying attention when I, uh, I'm not writing my emails while, while we're having this fantastic discussion, but... Uh, he said he was um, convinced that the skills could be acquired. And, and so are we at, at Never Take Late, um, which uh, when we focus on trying to bridge the digital gap for older adults, uh, we also believe in uh, lifelong learning, i.e. we have, most of us gain an enormous amount of years uh, of longevity compared to several generations back and not learning and keeping on educating ourselves during these years is sort of a conundrum to me. Um, so especially since neurological research has proved that our brain can still learn even in, in the last, uh, the later years of our life. So Never Take Late is all about education in case um, this was not clear. And we believe we can educate and we should educate uh, with some uh, constraint uh, that I will come back to, uh, Daniela touched upon, the older population. Um, so we actually reach out to a, a university, to a higher uh, education institution and created a program that would be created for 18 and 20 and 22 and you know, years old students, master students in the same vein, but knowing we had non-traditional learners in front of us. And we focused on uh, teaching uh, the older adults on how to use a tablet, which shows this device because it tends to be a bit less expensive than a laptop, larger than a phone, which has uh, vision issues for older adults. 
and could be transportable and shareable. And we, way before the pandemic, uh, chose to entice the older adult to be educated and have fun because, you know, when you don't have that many years in front of you, maybe you think oh, I have better things to do, even though, as somebody said, um, I think it was Daniela again, that it's, it's almost like being a handicap not to have this education. So we taught them, um, we're teaching them, sorry, how to use Zoom and then to via Zoom to open the world to many other and, uh, enticements like uh, learning how to volunteer online because now they can have a video conference too, learning how to expand their knowledge through uh, MOOCs and edX and other online universities, etc. And um, in terms of, of, of safety, because, you know, you open the world to something that is, we all said it, uh, there's no, I don't think there is no option to be off the grid. I think Gary said that, uh, but at the same time, it's not free. When, you know, when people say, uh, oh, well, you know, this, is, this app is free, that's not true. We are exchanging a lot of information and we don't know under which cons considerations, under which use. Um, and so we are trying to also, as much as we can, uh, to teach cybersecurity to our users. And this is actually a very important part of our programs because as we age, we tend to be uh, a much higher proportion uh, of victims of fraud. So I could speak too much and I don't want to take any more time, but that's, you know, in a nutshell, we believe in education to bridge that digital gap, but education that's really fought out to respect the type of learners we have, to respect the fact that it's a foreign language, you know, the technology is a foreign language. So we use linguists as well in our program to to try to enhance the possibility that this learning, as you said, Alex, will have to change. You know, we, the, the lessons we are teaching uh, today are not going to be the same we'll teach in six months. So awesome. that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Florence. Thank you. And thank you for the wonderful uh, description of the work you're doing. Um, Daniela, you touched the subject from a, a different uh, way, and you also talked about metaverse. Um, is this creating a much bigger digital divide? We talked about accessing a tablet and a bank account. What about metaverse and the digital divide that uh, this new whole world is creating? Uh, you're, you're muted. Sorry, Daniela, you're muted. You can look at it a bit uh, from a slightly sarcastic point of view that I do think the complexity of the different devices that we're handling today, the, un the failing of intelligence that these devices are not yet communicating with each other, um, causes a lot of stress, not just for those that don't know how to use them, also for those that know how to use them, because you're on thousands of channels and you have um, supermarkets and accounts and I don't know what, and actually you're on this thing constantly. I'll bite that the children don't even get the attention of the parents anymore, right? So um, I do think this trend will go into simplification. We will kind of put the glasses on, we will move the boxes around and it will become much easier for elders also to use it because they put the glasses on and they, if they see what they can see, then that will be probably also in the virtual space, probably more and more easy to handle. Is that the really wishing thing I would like to see? That's another conversation to have, right? And what is actually, what is failing also is if you look, for example, I don't only think of the digital divide that happens um, with elder generation. I also think we have a digital device that makes you think differently, that makes you act differently, that, you know, youngers are acting like avatars, etc. How do elders act? And then I will again allow myself to say, look who's leading the world. A lot of them are not digitally savvy. I could make a bet. If you would overcome them with 250 clicks, et cetera, yes, they're all using Instagram for whatever purposes, but go beyond that and see how they're using it. I don't think they really know how these young people act and, and think and unite, right? And I just, um, I, I'm, I'm, I, 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 I think the, the fact digital divide is, is over a short time period still a divide and will unite because of technology advancing. So I think that problem will be solved. 
But as said, there comes the second point. If it's solved, <laughs> is that for the good? Yeah, is it for the good? That's yeah. another question. And I do think besides education, the digital divide, um, there should be also education with the digital divide to understand that there should be also a, um, a certain teaching of awareness while entering into the digital space. Because especially for an elder person to concentrate suddenly on, you know, on the quick speed of picture, just if you take the speed of pictures on the digital devices, it's much more higher than the films they used to see many, many years ago. Thank just you. as an example. Yes, yes. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. Um, uh, um, Girish, can we come back to you and uh, ask you about the next steps, about how we should deal with the digital divide from your point of view? Well, I mean, th that's both an important and yet a very broad question, right? I mean, as we discussed before, there are multiple causes for digital divides, some of which are within the control of people, some of which are something which the governments have to work, things like the splintering and the balkanization of the internet with, you know, a Russian internet and a Chinese internet and a Western internet is not something we can necessarily solve. It's, 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 it's a far greater, bigger problem there is. Uh, but one of the things I, as a venture investor, always worry about is we so get caught up in the benefits of any new technology or application or whatever that we often overlook the unintended consequences. Mm -hmm. There are things which we don't realize at that time, but which come back to bite us, right? And so if you look at the flip side or the unintended consequences of being in the digital world, you know, we, we know them all, right? It's, it's, it's the excess wastage of time. It's, it's children leading a sedentary lifestyle. It's the evils of social media, whether it's Instagram or Facebook or whatever. You know, the young girls looking at all those skinny women they see or whatever they think is, is appropriate. Uh, misinformation, whether it's political, social, the challenges of cybersecurity and fraud. Uh, excess gambling, uh, access to pornography for very young people, uh, and, and the loss of privacy. And it isn't just the fact that, you know, I get ads I have no interest in, but I don't even know which government, which agency is tracking me, doing what, etc. So all these things are also something, you know, in as much as we have to make sure that the internet is something or, you know, or the digital media or whatever is something which we need to create access to because that's where the world has moved to. Uh, we cannot ignore the fact that all these other things are lurking, right? I mean, we're sort of crossing this bridge and then all these crocodiles and alligators and lions are sort of just waiting for us to take a misstep and, and we get swallowed by them. And, and, and I know all this is true because I read somewhere that Julius Caesar said that the internet is very dangerous. <laughs> this is so nice. Thank you, Girish. Thank you very much. Um, Jorge, uh, can we go back to you in Mexico? And you, you've heard from um, different people, different definitions. And um, I guess that the way that you also treat elderly people in order, you know, you help elderly people to close the digital divide is something that will become more challenging and not, not less challenging uh, as we move on. What is your view on the next day? Um, let me share with you all that I, I am a chronicle optimistic uh, person. So, so I, I do believe in abundance and, and that the world can be better. I know this is challenging times and, and the world's not behaving the way I should I should be uh, thinking about. But the, the thing is, there are a couple of, of, of ideas that come to my mind just listening to you all. Um, the Internet of Things, I believe, is going to make it easier for all of us the way that we interact with technology. And that, that has been happening the last 20 years. Also, the metaverse uh, that uh, Daniela pointed out, uh, it's so easy to do it, either if you're an old people or you are uh, in some kind of disadvantage, even if you're blind, if you're deaf. There are a lot of things going there. So Internet of Things 
is going to do the mechanical shift that also um, Girish also mentioned about, about the Americans. The Americans want, they, they freak with the screen. They won't give them a screen. They will give them a mechanic thing that has inside the Internet of Things behaving the way they are expecting to do it. So what I believe is that in the elderly, we are going to put and to simplify a lot of tasks. And, and, and just an example, there's this machine called the Thermomix, which is this device where you can cook your meals. And the story of the Thermomix is beautiful. This was developed for the old people in Germany not to get burned with a stove. Today, it has the Internet of Things inside. It has internet, it has information, but the first motive of doing the thermomix, I know it's super popular in all age groups, but the intention of building thermomix was you can cook a soup without turning on the fire. So in that little example, let, let me try to open it and, and, and just the thought of this philosopher of Ortega y Gasset from, from Spain. This is the, the, a, tiny, a tiny proportion, proportion of humans working for the mass man. And the mass man wants to see Facebook and Instagram, and that will be their digital divide, more intellectual than digital. And there's a percentage of humans that will be driving the Internet of Things, the Internet, the education, the learning, and the things trying to drive up the world. But that's humanity um, before the digital age. So what I think we should be thinking about is, is humans, are, are humans already changing the way we think? Are we evolving or, or we're just being the same kind as Ortega Gasset described or Socrates described 2000 years ago, and we just have more technology? So I believe that the, the Internet of Things and the mechanical world inserted in, in all these metaverse and Internet of Things is going to make it easier. Thank you. Thank you, Jorge. Victor, back to you again. How do you, how do you see the next day? How do you, you, al you already gave us a hint about the simplification, as uh, Florence said, of um, accessing uh, new technology and, uh, you know, having an easier interface. Access will be universal and you have the choice of which life you want to you wanna be part of. If you like more the physical life or you wake up one week and you want to stay in whatever you call the Web3, the metaverse, nobody knows in reality what's going to be. Maybe it's going to be an augmented Zoom. <laughs> but uh, because I'm not, I'm not a big fan of of the hypes and the concepts because it was going to happen with virtual reality and augmented reality and it ended up being something else and now it's going to be in reality the metaverse that is going to be a little bit more 3d and it's like same with every time there's an innovation there is a, a sense of adapting it to the market and it's being something different because every innovation is driven by idealists who initially want to change the world and later implemented by people who have to economic sense right so it's always a, a slight deviation of some type for every single technology. And I think I'm, I'm pretty optimistic about it. I mean, just I had a debate with a girl who was saying that she wanted to decentralize governments in blockchain. I said, that's cool for Singapore. We'll never work with the European ones. We are extremely inefficient, right? So there's always this uh, idea that technology can solve everything. But it's more on, it still will be in hands of humans as long as we are not overcome by, by machines, then we'll have to worry about. Well, you know, in, in the 70s, they also had a similar program where you could go into a virtual world and decide not to live in the real world. It was called LSD. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, see, it's, going, it's going to be a very, very remote. We saw it with the COVID. It's going to be an, some sort for me now of adapt of Less, less needs to travel or uh, the concentration of industries in certain global hubs. I'm seeing that in Dubai. It's the first time I see movement of people from around the world to make a capital of whatever. 
of uh, cryptos, fintech, whatever you want to call it. With a concentration of talent by hubs and poles, and people will be uh, moving from pole to, to pole to to put together uh, companies, innovations, etc. So I think digital divide will always exist because it's going to be always something new. For example, I had a digital divide to overcome with NFTs for a while until I understood what, what it was. But you still have a digital divide of many things in, in the crypto space itself. This might be having a, a trading desk. No? It, it never ends in reality. You have to, to keep up 24-7. Thank you. Uh, I think we, we've heard uh, very interesting viewpoints um, in, in some sense, uh, the common ground and in some sense, quite different. Can you, can we go um, in, in the last few minutes, we have one more round and can you think of something that really um, gives an umbrella of how we can close, uh, I, I wouldn't say, you know, completely close the digital divide. Is it about for example, um, inspiring people not to feel afraid about tomorrow. Because if you're afraid about tomorrow, then you don't uh, look forward to it and you don't actually proactively engage in whatever you need to do uh, in order to close that digital divide. Should we actually ask uh, and demand and lobby for uh, whatever progress we have to be faster and more widely spread uh, as, as a prerequisite of, of uh, what we do and how we move forward. Can you think of an umbrella that cuts across what we discussed, whether that's gender, whether that's geography, whether that's age, and, um, a social status or education? Can, can you uh, close with a uh, thought like that? Should we start again from, from you, Florence? That's absolutely unfair. It's a very idealistic uh, question, but I love it. it. <laughs> I love it. I mean, you know, you, you need to dream uh, before you can actually implement uh, making some money, as Victor said, hopefully, uh, anything. And so I'm going to repeat myself because I believe a, a large part of education is about repetition. And I, uh, you know, our, our logo is never too late to learn. So the big umbrella here and I'm not sure who can implement it, except all of us, including government and institutions of education, is about teaching and, and making sure that it's never too late to learn um, to all our citizens that uh, the, the obligation to, uh, to go out and keep on learning new skills, whatever these skills are, and hopefully they are digital, is, is, is fundamental. So Thank this you. is my idealistic umbrella, Alex. I think it's never too, le too, too late to learn for uh, leaders as well, Daniela. Should we, should we uh, ask them to, to prove they can understand the world of tomorrow before they engage in taking decisions? Sorry, yeah, you're muted again. No, I would remove them. <laughs> totally. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <From the equation. laughs> so, yeah, so I think, uh, really, I think ultimate benefit, so I think uh, it should be base income for everyone. We should have a share that every, if you say idealistic, we should have a global president dedicated to peace in the, and maybe in the tandem position so that all generations are represented. I think the passports should be deleted. I think that the war game in the economies should end. And we should uprise to live with Mother Earth and not on Earth, as the human tends to ride on horses instead of with horses, right? And I think then we would make a great progress. And until then, I'm, I'm not very hopeful. I do think we have a legacy that we're always failing, uh, to, we're always building our own holes to fall into. Thank you, Daniela. I'm very hopeful from this discussion. Uh, because as long as really, really, as long as long as there are people who think that way, um, you know, there's hope. But of course, hope does. does oh, last. for sure. You know, you have to fight uh, for sure. But I'm, I'm, I'm. Would I, if I see what's in the Ukraine, and I'm sorry to see what I'm seeing. Well, you know, it's the not. World... It's, it's not. It's not for the, the the top guys. It's for the masses that are now suffering that actually had a very harmonic and peaceful life together. Yes, you're right. Girish, what's your idealistic view of a better tomorrow? You know, look, 
there is technology and there are people, right? All through history, technology has tried to benefit people, but bad people have used that same technology and hurt other people. So at the end of the day, we can fix the hardware problem. How do we fix the software problem is the, is the big issue. So it, it doesn't, you know, new technologies just make killing faster and more efficient, etc. Okay. So when, when we talk about the digital divide, I think we have to be careful to make sure that we get 100% digital. I think we do need to maintain parallel roads. You know, we, you know, as somebody once said, be careful what you wish for, you might get it. And if we become 100% digital and all the time under surveillance of the government, et cetera, et cetera, uh, it, that's not going to be a very pleasant world. So unless we fix the challenges we find today with technology, and those are human issues, not technological issues, until we find a way to address them in some way, I would say, let's be cautious about how fast we run into this uh, brave new world. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Girish. Jorge. It's, um, it's something. Tell us, tell us something hopeful. Uh, well, I, I, I'm, I'm sure I, I am sure I don't know. But what I think, uh, first, I really like the concept of the blockchain, of dividing from a democratic perspective the power among all those who have access to that. And of course, the digital divide is dividing right now everything. But uh, once you're born with a blockchain inserted, in order to be part of society, either in a global perspective, as Daniel said, or in a national perspective, as the way is now, I am sure that the world will be better just because the collective defend each other and the individual is trying to conquer. And we're seeing this in Ukraine. I'm sure about society, no one wants a war. But there are a couple of leaders that believe that the war needed in order to defend whatever thing they're defending. So in this case, if you are represented through blockchain anonymously, but collectively, and the decisions are not made by one or a collection of power uh, government organs, I do believe that we have a chance. But for that, there's the software problem, the education problem also, and again, the technology one. So, Let's hack it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have to. Uh, but but I, I'm hopeful in the thing that every day we're moving forward. Although we have these uh, bumps around the, the road, we're humans. I mean, Jurari described it in Sapiens really, really, really condensed. We're animals. So we're trying to educate ourselves, even the leaders. Thank you. Thank you, Jorge. Back to you, Victor. Last but not least. Uh, tell, us, okay. tell, tell us your optimistic view in a, in a, in a broad, idealistic way. I, I think we're going we gonna to be better because we live the fastest ever pro pace of progress in humanity. Uh, when... We, instead of being pessimistic about it, let's let's remember that many times we said the world was going to end in the 2000 because of the computer, 2012 because of the Mayas. Then I visited the Mayas and realized they, 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 the people who said that was fake because the calendar was wrongly read in Mexico. Uh, never was what uh, what the what the hype was, right? So so I think it's it's every time you open a a new a new box of possibilities. Yeah, it has unintended consequences. Yeah, it has evil. But even billions need to be intelligent to use them. So I think I think it has much more uh, benefits than than inconveniences. And and we cannot predict what's going on. Since to me, the point where you cannot predict what's going to happen starts with, from the mobile apps. From Symbian onwards, you lose you lose the taste of what is a linear line, and it then becomes exponential and does things like this, like that, whatever. And, and out of the blue, things that you cannot control uh, appear and another innovation. And that's where decentralization starts from my, from my perspective. Thank you. We've um, managed to pass our uh, uh, time by five minutes. I wish I had a lot more time to discuss with you all. It's a, it's a very interesting discussion. And I like the diversity and the, and the, 
uh, different viewpoints and, and the common ground uh, coming from it. I would like to thank you very much for um, this panel. I'm, I'm really honored. Uh, thank you, Florence. Florence, you, you, we are actually connected from Miami now. Exactly. Uh, thank you, Daniela. Daniela Homan, thank you for uh, joining us and for thank sharing you, us all your thoughts from uh, Switzerland. Uh, thank you very much, Girish. Um, Girish Natkani. Uh, you are you are now where actually I never asked. I, I'm in Paris at the moment. You are in Paris. Perfect, perfect. Thank you, Jorge. Thank you, Jorge Lopez, for joining us uh, you, from Alex. Mexico. And uh, thank you, Victor Guiche, for thank you. joining us as well. Thank you. Have a thank wonderful uh, day. Thank you, bye everyone. Bye, 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 guys. Thank bye you bye. very much. Thank you. Bye, bye.